Okay, awesome. So uh, welcome back for um, what we are on day number seven of our 12 day academy. So we're on the downhill side at this point. Um, exactly, which I know these crazy sprints move fast. And so uh, we are um, making a lot of progress quickly. And I, I know it's a lot and it's really overwhelming. Um, and uh, so, and people have been jumping in and out. So that's fine. And I'm glad to see some faces uh, today. Um, so good. Welcome back, Sean and Nele and Kristen, everyone. So um, you guys, anyone in San Diego? Like we made this accommodation other than Ben. Ben, <laughs> ben is definitely accommodating. Yeah, exactly. I, I know. Any, what are you going to do? So uh, we're trying to work with them, but it is San Diego. They were probably out late last night having a good time. So, um, so for those watching on video uh, today, we want to talk um, performance assessment and, and cover two other big domains in performance assessment. We're going to do student-led conferences to kick us off here in a minute. And that's, it's not, we're not going to spend too much time on student-led conferences, even though we do love it. Um, we're going to spend more time today around defenses, um, and we'll talk about what to call those things, but uh, we'll spend more time around that because um, it's more of the structural anchor that you need to do sustainable uh, deeper learning reform. Uh, you need a way eventually to sort of replace tests, and the defense structure gives you more of a, a structure to do some of that replacement work. And so uh, we'll talk about a school. We're going to take a deep dive into a school that has sort of completely fully replaced tests, and they've been doing it for almost 30 years. And so, um, you know, like completely sustainable way of doing uh, defenses. And so we'll sort of take a deep dive into that. And then at some point this morning, Carmen in San Diego will join, um, and she'll talk about then scaling defenses to tens of thousands of kids in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and so, like, what is it? So we'll talk about really simple ways to do it, but then like as you think about scaling to large populations, what does that look and feel like? So that is sort of the big agenda for today. Uh, ben has put Padlet over into the chat. We might do that again for a couple of new folks that have joined. Um, but so we'll work from Padlet and we'll work a little bit from a deck, but that's sort of our big topical things for today. I was uploading the YouTube videos from our recordings and now I've lost all my, I gotta reopen my screens. So, uh, sorry. Um, anyway, um, okay, Ben, yeah. jump in. Who is yeah, sorry, no, just go. He was at High Tech High last night, hanging out, getting things ready. They've got, you got, what do you got? What's, what school could be? He's got their own like booth. And I we saw- We got a lounge. It, yeah, I, I thought, I was trying to wrap my head around it. It's like, we have like, I think four couches and like four chairs we have a selfie groupie station um there's stuff like beach balls and you know it's going to be it's a really fun area uh high tech high is a really cool um space and like there's different buildings like there's an elementary school there's an international school which i didn't i wasn't aware of so i'm gonna have to learn more about that and then the middle school and you can walk between all of them so uh yeah very very cool space excited to explore uh, explore it more um, but thanks for everybody jumping. Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for jumping on the Padlet. We see a lot of people getting to hang out with good friends, helping the, uh, someone's getting their, their house ready for stale. Someone went to uh, the, the conservatory, which looks amazing. I want to visit uh, a couple of people doing yard work and stuff, which is, which is, it sounds funny, but I actually miss doing like house projects and stuff like that, you know, living in the uh, townhomes and such overseas you know you don't have a you don't get to work on your house or you know do fun yard projects and stuff so I know it sounds funny but um but I wanted to ask if Lori are you going to be able to play us anything today if we have time you have like all these instruments on the back on the background on the wall there so do you play yeah. any of those Lori come on <laughs> maybe later if we have time not not to pressure you but if you feel inspired, I think that would be a, what a wonderful way to start the day if you could play us a little tune, a little something later. So think about it. Yeah, if we, Laura, if we have time at the exhibit. end, maybe. Yeah, she yeah. could exhibit her, her math. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Demonstration of learning. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, enough chitter chatter. Justin, uh, what do you got for us? All right, superb. So uh, the deck is in the Padlet if you want to open it up. Embedded in the deck today are a lot of little video snippet things. 
Um, and so uh, we're going to sort of digest the school in small little parts in, in just a minute. Um, of course, the Padlet, get that thing up and running. Ben has just put it into the chat. And then um, here is sort of our flow for today as soon as that loads. Uh, we're going to start with where we left off with Share Your Learning. Student-led conferences, we're going to think about the myths around these presentations of learning, defenses of learning. Like, there's a lot of pre-baked thinking out there, and we're going to take some time to try to get that down. Um, and then we'll take that deep dive before we hear more about scaling. So we left off last time around shareyourlearning.org. I thought we would start there again because shareyourlearning.org is one of the sort of side projects of the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. And so uh, since we're talking High Tech High and they're out there hanging out, and I think Michelle Pledger, who was one of the uh, people that put the big effort behind shareyourlearning.org, and you see her face on those videos a lot, uh, she is frequently the MC of the Deeper Learning Conference, and so it, I don't know if she's going to MC the conference uh, this year or not. But um, you know, I, she's going to be front and center. She's going to have a probably going to have a pretty action-packed day hosting. I don't know how many people join at that conference. At least several thousand, I would say, is where we're at on a given year right now. Um, but I wanted to circle back around to that because inside of that Share Your Learning. Um, dot org, they group performance assessment into these three big areas. Now, these three big areas are not the end-all be-all of performance assessment. There's, there's many more things you can do with performance assessment than these three. A thing that uh, I loved um, from Northern Kentucky, with a school in Northern Kentucky, sort of a CTE kind of early college school, uh, they do a thing called Chalk Talks, and uh, it's super simple. They have a little bitty whiteboard that is um, you know, just a handheld whiteboard and a single whiteboard marker. And it's the student's job to just explain what they know about a given topic with the whiteboard and that marker to a small panel. Um, so, and I, it's probably called Chalk Talks because at one point this was done with chalkboards, I'm assuming. Um, anyway, so um, I, I love that format. For performance assessment. So there's, there's many different formats for performance assessment, but these are the th sort of three big anchors that are frequently talked about as, you know, a deeper learning school will typically be doing at least one, probably more of these three big anchor performance assessment models um, as sort of a critical assessment tool in their building. Uh, so if you remember back to last week, if not, we've got the videos um, we talked all about exhibitions of learning and we checked out the exhibitions of learning toolkit. So today we're going to work on those other two. Um, before then on Thursday, Laura's in the room. Uh, Laura's then going to start to share more about how do a system of performance assessments begin to come together, right? So as you start to plug and play multiple pieces of a performance assessment system, how does that begin to come together? And at what point does this begin to feel like a competency-based assessment model, which is a different place to be? And so that's where we'll get to on Thursday. Um, okay, so that is, uh, we're gonna take this look at student-led conferences first. All right, so I've got a few video snippets throughout the day. Um, this one is just a quick one from Edutopia to get your mind in the game. Before I even do this though, let me stop share and just ask, who's already doing this in their schools and feels like I already got student-led conferences down 100%. I know what's going on here and we don't, like, if we don't need to unpack student-led conferences, we can spend more time on defenses. But, you know, I want to make sure it's there. And seriously, raise hand or throw in chat, like, already doing this thing. Yeah, and even if it's not, like, 100% dialed in, like, maybe you're trying it, maybe you're seeing some hiccups or... Uh, great, Mark's done a version, you know, like, let us know why you love them, Kristen uh, loves them, why why you love them, why they're successful, what maybe some people run into some um, speed bumps when they they try to to roll these out, like, what are, what are your thoughts on this, where are you at? Never done never it or heard of it. Never heard okay, of it. Okay, that's fine, too, fine, yeah. too. 
And I'm guessing it sounds like quite a bit of the room is still in exploratory mode and may not have this like baked oh, all yeah. the way into okay. the design. Um, Great. So fine, let's go ahead and unpack because let me, this is a lot of what we do at NextGen at our center with these academies is try to give easy entry points. Student-led conferences is another easy entry point, particularly for elementary. Um, the, this is an easy entry point. And so, um, you know, if you're looking, and, and we're going to talk defenses later, defenses are not as easy as an entry point. So let's, let's get this easy entry point in our backpack first. Sorry, you'll see, hear me use backpack language today because we're at Carmen on. So we're going to talk backpacks, um, but uh, we'll do this one first and then we'll switch over. Okay, sorry. I'll, let me pop back in and we'll, we'll do what we were planning. So let me preface this a little bit. Sorry, before you start, Justin. <laughs> is let's think back to the science of learning, right? And this idea that knowledge is constructed and learning is a process over time, right? And kids put together new knowledge with, you know, um, evidence and then feedback on that evidence. And so why I love student-led conferences is because it starts to shift the conversation from a single output to discussions around actually what learning means. And so students are actually talking about the process they went through to arrive at wherever they are at that time, because they may not, the conference may not be them talking about a final product. It may be them talking about they're on step number three of seven, right? So it starts to move the conversation to this idea that like learning is a process that the learner is involved in with somebody else someone else is giving them feedback and they're, pr they're producing evidence of where they're at as they progress towards that that outcome right so parents start to understand that a bubble sheet or a test where you just put a check on it doesn't provide the student any information on what to do next on how to actually move to the next step in that process of learning and so student-led conferences is an easy way to start that conversation and to start to shift the understanding of what it means for people to learn, all right? So uh, that's why I love you know, student-led conferences is it's, it's really the first step in educating parents what learning actually looks like in a classroom or should look like in a classroom, you know, we aspire to. So that's just my little little pitch on like why student-led conferences, it's an easy, easy, easy it's an easy way actually to start the conversation and because getting your parents on side and educating your community, uh, you know, that shift from behaviorism to constructivism, like that's how we sort of kick this off. Beautiful way to do it. Ben has strong thoughts on student-led conferences as you're seeing. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yay. Um, and uh, did you preview the video? Because this video actually comes from the science of learning. And oh, no, I have, sorry. <laughs> um, no, 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 you're exactly yeah. on it, right? This right. is linking back directly to where we were starting this entire academy, grounding it in the science of learning. And you'll see inside of this where Linda Darling Hammond is, is popping back around and saying, like, look at the sort of deep learning skills that are being built in this context. All right, let's go then for a quick look. Oh, I didn't share properly. Ben, man. All right, you got it. Yeah, share your screen, share the audio. Yeah, I have to learn how to do this properly. I forget, like, why doesn't Zoom just do it as the default? That I know, the, I know. Interesting question. All right, I'm sorry, that was a completely messy with part. my peers. It's really hard for me to apologize. I was wondering if you guys have any tips. Like, a really important aspect of learning is developing agency and responsibility. That also requires being resourceful. It requires being metacognitive, being able to reflect on where you are and what you need to do to move forward. And we see all of that in the student-led conference. So often in anything that you do in education, in life, students always feel like, oh, adults are always saying in their opinion, I don't have a voice, I never have any say. So part of what we do with the student-led meetings is they get a chance to say what their concerns are, how they see things. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Alec led his own meeting today. And we bring in all teachers, me, parents, to say, here are some strengths of mine, and here are some challenges that I need help with. 
expressing Miss Murphy and his was all my represent how I feel and my schoolwork and tests and stuff is pretty good. But when it comes to homework, it's really bad. It allows all of us to get all on the same page. Homework really hurt my grades this quarter, so that's something I really need to improve. In student-led conferences, we see students learning these skills of how to articulate their needs, make plans to improve, get help from others, and own the goals that they set for themselves. The second I get home, I don't feel like doing anything else involved in school. So I was actually going to ask you guys if you guys had any ideas. Social and emotional competencies have to do with the ways that we recognize our emotions and manage them, the ways in which we interact interpersonally with others, the ways in which we organize ourselves to get things done. For me, it's actually being able to sit down and get it done, because once I sit down and get it done, it's going to get done. Getting started is the hardest part for me. Just staying after and doing homework with your friends where you go home is a good Okay. We'll cut the video there. The full thing is available in the Padlet, of course. Um, but to give you a little peek inside, now that is student-led conferences that was being done uh, at, looks like, a high school-aged kid who's having to make sense of this. You can really see a lot of what's going on in that context, though. And I will say that, like, that was an abnormally large group for student-led conferences, having that many people in the room together. Um, I don't think that that's normal. I think this is more normal, where it's a kid, it's a, a teacher, and it is family member or two. So like more normal looks like this is, uh, especially at the elementary years, these are pictures of student-led conferences that happened in Kentucky, uh, where you, know, you have kids that are sort of working through uh, a lot of prompting, especially in the early years. Um, you, you know, you can't just ask a kid to lead a meeting like this without a lot of structure and format and practicing. Um, and so uh, this is uh, just a better sense of, of, of what it looks like. There is self-reflection going on, right? We are trying to help the kids be metacognitive, that fancy word that Linda Darling Hammond used. Metacognitive is like reflecting on their own learning. And so how do we help them begin to reflect on what their own journey is. Um, and so self-reflection and goal setting, uh, rehearsing these student-led conferences with a buddy. You can see a picture of that with a good UK shirt on, yay kid. And then uh, the actual student-led conference itself. And you can see mother is there at the table, a brother sitting behind father in the back, a little confused about everything that's going on, apparently in that video. <laughs> um, okay, but that is a sense of what it looks like for real for us in Kentucky over these various years. Um, a lot more low key than um, the thing that they did for the video for Edutopia showing up with cameras. Um, anyway, okay, but to get a sense of sort of what that looks like, um, I've put into the chat a bunch of um, resources about especially elementary level uh, where, how to do this, tools, right? Like, what are we learning this year? Here's a self-evaluation tool. Uh, what's the work habits and, and social skills? If you had a, a portrait of a graduate, you would align your work habits and social skills to your portrait of a graduate. Um, and then you can see over there on the right is like the play-by-play -play of a student-led conference. Like, what is actually happening on this day? Um, you know, you Kids come in, the kids are responsible for introductions and telling their parents where to sit. Um, the the uh, kids explain uh, why they are there. Um, they tell the parents, like, here's how the meeting is going to go, right? Like, <laughs> we're going to save our questions to the end. <laughs> so, like, I just love the beauty of it, right? Um, and then, of course, you, the major component parts, what we're learning, my own self-evaluation, my work habits, and then my goals, um, and then can have a conversation as a team around how you get to those work habits, goals, all of those component parts of what's going on in the kid's journey in that given year. So that is a super quick insight into the world of student-led conferences, just bringing it back here to discussion with all of you, thoughts or questions about that from a super quick insight and then any uh, experiences you've had in this space, I think others would love to hear from as well.
Well, no one wants to jump in. I do want to turn it over to Ben. Okay, Mark, jump in. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at this and thinking it's really amazing. Um, and then thinking about my experience in various uh, schools. And I know that from my experience, it's really helpful for the student to have lots of rehearsal time ahead of the conference and time to actually reflect in small groups with peers and maybe as a whole class and with the teacher and, and having cycles of reflection help deepen the thinking before the conference. So I just say that because sometimes when we're making our plans, we don't, I, I think you just need to dedicate a big chunk of time to that depth of reflection for the students. And um, in some cases, like when I taught in a portable uh, and kind of was out, out uh, where we could just, I guess what I'm getting at is there, I've been in certain, certain environments where this wasn't valued as an, an important part of the learning process. It was like, did you get to workbook page like 14 today? And so you just have to um, navigate some of that. But I mean, as you're sharing this, like I'm a thousand percent behind you. I think this is like the deepest you can go in terms of student learning and reflection and, and developing their capacity for all of those skills. It's just amazing. Yeah, and not that massively difficult. Um, you know, it, 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 you, you're right that it takes time. You got to practice. The kids have to get used to it. They have to build their own skill sets around this. And, but, but on the, on the grand screen, like what you're not necessarily doing here is launching a whole new project. You can, you can do student led conferences right now, not making a single deeper learning change in your building. You could implement this student led conference component and still get some of those uh, deeper learning outcomes around metacognition, reflection on their own journey, better conversations with parents. And so like this is that's why we call this specifically for elementary a really easy entry point. I do think it's a little bit harder as the kids get older into middle school and high school, you know, they become like too cool to talk about their own stuff. And like you've got to break through the kind of like barriers. A lot of barriers have been built by that point uh, that don't exist in elementary. And so um, in, that's why I think it's an easier point for elementary. It's a little harder for middle and high because you got to get through those barriers. But it only reinforces why to start in elementary so that those barriers don't get built in the first place. Um, anyway, okay. Now, Ben so, has a lot. So I'm going to add one so, other. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. And then, Kristen, if you want to jump in after Mark's done, feel free. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, well, another element to this that I love is that there's a, an assessment that reflects back on the teacher. Like when the student has to say, um, what's really important that I learned this year? Like you're just, I guess what I'm thinking is there are some scenarios where you're gonna have students that are like, I just learned about how to fill out a worksheet, you know? And so, so you have to also be thinking about like, as I'm teaching these kids, I need to be engaging them to the level where they're gonna be able to say, A, B, C was really powerful and meaning, meaningful for me. You know, so what I love is it's a, it's a two-way assessment. It's assessing the student, but also in a sense, it's assessing the depth of the learning that's happening in the classroom because you see that reflected in the student. So Justin and Mark, or anybody that's had um, the opportunity- Wait, hold on, Janelle, Janelle, sorry. Yeah. Kristen was gonna jump in. Sorry, oh, Chris, hold that ahead. thought. That's all right. I'm with Janelle, I'm fine, yeah. Um, I'll just quickly say, I'll just quickly since, um, I shared in the chat just this idea of the round. So Mark, I was agreeing with you in the chat that um, in my experience, we um, I've, I've <clears throat> supported teachers with transitioning to student-led conferences in grades four through eight. So that's my context. And um, we've developed an approach that works for this developmental level in this, um, um, you know, whether they're fourth graders or eighth graders, there are some nuances to, to each of those populations. But um, yeah, so we do rounds of practice and Mark, that's what I was agreeing with that this is not, you know, just turn it over and, and it's something that students need to practice, especially those fourth and fifth graders who may not be used to reflecting on their learning. So we asked two questions, what did you learn and how did you learn it? And that structures the student reflection and then um, they develop their way of showing it. And with our older students, sixth, seventh and eighth graders, we give them, you know, full Rain in terms of how they show that, um, what they learned and how they learned. And that gets really interesting. Last year, um, we had a group 
two students wanted to pair and do a skit to show how they how they were learning. Um, and this is largely literacy. That's my my discipline. Uh, how they uh, approached um, comprehending the text through a skit. So that was really cool, and it was so super metacognitive to use that jargon. So Mark, I was agreeing with you and saying that the rounds of practice with uh, feedback between pairs or students, groups of students that's specific, kind, and helpful is really valuable. Yeah, so Janelle, jump in, yeah. I just, Sorry, I, I, I think you, up. no, I think Krista also just, you know, to how to have our um, teachers feel comfortable of, you know, leading and engaging this process too. So I think that practice, mm -hmm. not only with our learners, but having our teachers also practicing these types of things would also lead to success. So I just didn't know if anybody had any experiences with how to get even the teachers to have, you only know what you know, right? So how to get them uh, more of some knowledge in that area? Well, I think, yeah, that's a super great question, Janelle. And I think sort of we kind of have mentioned it a couple of times, but like, like, let's just name it here, is the metacognition is what we're really after. And so when students are, are talking about their learning, that's the most important piece here. And so it shouldn't be vastly different from how they're engaging with learning all the time. Like we should be building in reflection, right? Because you, you don't learn in the doing, you learn on reflecting on the doing, right? And so, yeah, we do have to practice the actual structure of the, the the student-led conference, like here, here are the things that I'm going to do. But the process of reflecting, the process of metacognition, should be, or you know, we hope that it would be more central to how we do teaching and learning. Because if we look at the science of learning, you know, understanding where you are in that process and what you need to do for that next step is central to how we learn. So that's what another reason why I love student-led conferences. We're moving towards that. We have to be providing evidence that that's taking place in the classroom. Because I think Mark made a great point. If you're just saying that we're teaching page 18 or 19 or 20, you know, that's not going to lead to that metacognition of what we're talking that's about. That's not here. rich evidence of learning. Nope. Yeah, exactly. Nope. Yeah. Uh, can I jump in just on that one? You know, I was thinking about that very question, how to um, get people thinking that have been thinking a certain way or have a certain tool set to start thinking differently. I really loved those scales that we did. I think it was last time where we all put dots on the scale. Um, like I thought something like that would be really helpful to do with a group so that they're being met, like, I mean, a group of teachers that are being metacognitive about their own assessment and then figuring out, hey, where are the dots all landing? And okay, now that we all know they land to the left, because largely the left was more sort of a classical approach, not classical, but you know what I mean? Um, then to ask them, is there a way that we could start moving those dots across this continuum and hey by the way what do you think would would student lend conferences be one of our starting points so i don't know if i don't know if that would work but i know i really loved those continuums and how we dotted them so ben jump in ben has a lot of experience with this both as an educator and as a parent and uh, the ib program has a lot to say so jump in a bit and around that uh, you want to share that slide real quick? So yeah, no worries. Yeah, just just yeah. So from my own kids and my own experience, uh, you know, teaching uh, in an IB school, international baccalaureate, in the PYP program, uh, mostly. Um, I don't know. We we don't we don't see the the deck, Justin. We see something else. My email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if anyone, if your anyone bank like balance. No. Email, be awesome. <laughs> All your bills. No. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's actually central to sort of how they approach uh, learning. So if you look at the the sort of circle, you know, we're, we're teachers, so we love circles. Um, but this 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 graphic sort of puts um, you know centers uh, centers students and their experience, and then we have like approaches to teaching and approaches to learning, and then directly outside of that, you have exhibition. Right, an exhibition is exhibition, but it's also a student-led conferences wrapped up into that. So you have approaches, uh, agency, and then action. So students are doing something, they're owning it, and then they're actually talking about their learning. So it's very central to how the IV actually approaches, you know, what takes place in a school. And it really, it really does allow students to understand themselves as learners 
And, you know, you really, you as a, as a teacher can learn so much about your students when they are talking about their learning, right? So there's like, we, we, we always talk about like, what's, What's the data we're using to make decisions, right? I'm a big fan of that. And so when you're getting that qualitative information from students about their learning, you really have a really deep understanding of how they actually learn, right? And so, and having them think through and share how they learn allows them to understand themselves better, right? And then you can actually ask questions and give them feedback, not on specific, you know, skills, but actually on like the skills of how, you, how they learn. So ultimately, I think it's just a really, really rich way to, you know, get in early with students and allow them to understand who they are as learners and then give them that agency to say, you know, I know I learn best when I do it this way, or these are the things that help me learn in these situations. Um, so it's it's great. It's just, a, it's a good way. And, and it leads to, you know, not to, not to and, I, and I was really sort of thinking about, do I share this or not share this? Um, <laughs> but you know, the IB is, is wonderful. I'm not knocking it, but, you know, my, my son is now entering into the final two years of the IB and that circle with exhibition accent, action and agency. If you look at the IB uh, DP, which is the final two years, that circle isn't there. And so from someone who's come up through the IB and is used to being asked to reflect on his own learning, be in charge of his own learning, share about his own learning, and then the last two years, they start focusing on a test and it all becomes what you get on the IB exam, right? Which will get you into college. And it's such a disconnect from everything that leads up to that point. And kids notice it, you know, kids are, are, are like, what are you talking about? Like, you've been telling me for 10 years <laughs> that it's important about what I think and about what I feel like I need to do for the next step. And now you're telling me that all that matters is this exam. So it's this real, almost like Christ, crisis of conscience for these kids. <laughs> so it's, it's just a really interesting space that I find, uh, you know, I find myself in as a parent at this, at this time. So I just kind of wanted to share that because kids, kids really do, they believe this. It's important to them. I just see on there, um, Ben, like that approaching approaches to teaching. I mean, I think that's where if we don't have those approaches to teaching, where are we going to go with this performance assessment or this uh, student led conferences, those kind of things. So I think that designing of the experiences needs to be at the forefront. Uh, Come 100%. Like we have, we want outcomes. We need to design for them, right? We want students to be agency uh, agents of their own learning. We need to design for that. We want students to be able to talk about their learning and where they are in that process. We need to design for that. And so like when we talk about practicing for student-led conferences, 100%. But we should be designing for them to engage in learning that way all the time. So it's not necessarily foreign to them. What's What we're practicing is just the actual structure of the things they have to remember to talk about, not how they talk about it. Student-led conferences. Okay, I love the intro in it um and it's it is it is a super valuable relatively easy entry point uh into the work and uh so when we do our work in Kentucky the schools that they're not ready to take the big dives into PBL yet or they're not you know if they're not one of those schools minimally we would expect this like minimally can we do some student-led conferencing yeah jump in Sean so I've been holding off because I think my thoughts are along the lines of a defense, but I'm trying to connect or separate the two between a student-led conference and a defense. And fundamentally, I, I see them as very similar. Mm -hmm. So full, full disclosure. So our school, we're building um, what it's called, um, we have a gateway system where students have to meet certain benchmarks and then they present in front of a panel of peers and adults and folks from the community. So Indeed. that's what we're going to do next. Yes. So that's called a defense. Um, what language gets used is actually really contested space. Uh, I didn't my, put... you see where I'm, I'm pausing and looking around. That's where that's coming from. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
I would, uh, uh, but a defense in the classical sense of that, or classical, sorry, Mark, what are we doing with that word today? I've got it in my head now. Um, so the, a defense in the, in the notion of that thing that lives in our education world is a student-led conference for the most part. The teachers may have more of a role of organizing and running that meeting and the kid, but, but ultimately a, a defense done well is a student-led conference. So I think that's completely accurate for you to push these two spaces together. Uh, Sean. But I think also to, to sort of also add on that, if you look at like a student-led conference as an entry point to a more robust defense, student-led conferences, um, you know, I guess kids don't have to be defensive, right? <laughs> they can actually, it, it's more of a self-reflection time. It's a, it's a time for the students to share where, uh, like what they're learning about themselves as learners what they're learning about the, themselves as a social being in the culture or context of a community. You know, it's, it's for them to sort of share what they're proud of, you know, what they're, what they're working on. What, you know, it doesn't have to be super centered in a, a piece of work. It's more contextually and sort of like, let's zoom out and look at like development, right? How are they developing as a learner? And so sometimes defenses are more like centered on evidence of learning, right? And they're, they're talking specifically about, you know, what they have learned and providing evidence of that. Uh, whereas student-led conferences can really start on, let's actually start to have discussions around you as a learner. And what are the, the you know, what are the dispositions you're developing? You know, what are the, the knowledge, what's the areas that you're interested in? you know, that, that sort of thing. So more like self-evaluation, you know, and then, and so, you know, oftentimes when students are kind of sharing work, parents start going, oh, look, I saw you spelled that word wrong, or maybe you missed a piece of punctuation there. And that's not really what a student-led conference is about. Typically, it's more about uh, what did I learn through doing this? What am I going to do next, right? It's more about them, their skills and dispositions as a learner. And is that, it, that, yeah, go ahead, Sean. I'm hearing it's more of what did I learn about myself? Yes, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, well done, Ben, on articulating some of that. But there, there is overlap here, absolutely. So, like, I, you're you're right to see the overlap in all of these performance assessment spaces. If you remember, you weren't here for the day one. On performance assessment, we're shifting the power dynamic, where Ultimately, a lot of the power of what's going on in a given assessment rests more with the kid. And so, you know, it's not a surprise that like we're seeing that power shift dynamic in multiple um, different ways and seeing similarities. On the question of language, this is one that um, I wasn't going to include, but you raised it, Sean. And so uh, I haven't teed up the whole background, but this is Colleen Meaning, Francis Parker, Parker Charter Essential School. I'll give you more details in a minute, but she uses, she does not like when I use the word defense. So I'll let her explain why she did not like uh, that word on, on our part. And we don't call it a defense. I think of that, that creates uh you know two sides an offense and a defense <laughs> and we're not about sides we're just you know there's room for everyone to achieve and i'm not on the other side of students you know i'm with them i'm trying to be an ally to their learning um a coach um so we just we don't think of it as defending <laughs> we think of it as exhibiting or demonstrating but we don't posture ourselves uh in a face-off type of way with kids there's nothing useful about that at this age or really any age i, I don't think so i'm not a fan of the expression that <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't embody what we stand for i guess is the bottom line but the fact that you've thought okay that is um from the a deeper learning detail series that we did as part of the what school could be academy last year we uh, did a deep dive interview with 10 different leaders. You got to see one of them already from uh, STEM Chattanooga when we looked at the really detailed look at how they built performance assessment and hung it right on the wall. That was from a different one of these deep dive interview series. But today we're going to take a different look at one. Um, hi, Carmen, and welcome from sunny San Diego. I, are you actually outside? <laughs> I am actually outside. 
Okay. It's a little chilly, but it's so pretty. You know how it is out here. You cannot stay and not to be outside. Well, yeah. lovely. So um, before we, Carmen, if you're okay to hang on for just a minute, I want to provide okay. a little bit of background around defenses slash presentations, whatever you want to call it. Um, expeditionary learning has their own way of calling it passage presentations. Uh, I link that up on the Padlet. So there's many different things you can you can call this. Um, I want to give just a little bit of history to set up my favorite school um, that does this work. Um, and by giving that little bit of history, I want to introduce the school. Uh, come on, click. Stay with me, presentations. Okay, the, so we're gonna. I'm gonna introduce uh, Francis Parker Charter Essential School in Devons, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Um, this school was um, supported in the early days by Ted Sizer. It is a charter school. Um, it is 30 years old, like in the early days of charter schools. It was, I think, Massachusetts' very first charter school, or if it wasn't first, it was maybe second. Um, Ted Sizer, Coalition for Essential Schools, Horace's Compromise. For those of you out in San Diego today, like Ben and Carmen and everyone that sees the high-tech high world, those roots run deep all the way back into the Northeast. And uh, the work that was going on with the Coalition of Essential Schools, uh, that work deeply informed um, Dennis Litke and the Met, which turned into big picture learning. A lot of the ideas that underpin high tech high were developed in the early years at the big picture company. Um, and then uh, Larry Rosenstock, uh, with a lot of money from Qualcomm, um, started up the uh, high tech high whole network that exists out there in San Diego. Only to provide a little bit of history of like the roots of this run really, really deep. Um, there's also 25 years of progressive education history in a journal called Horace that is on the coalition's page. If you, like me, just love reading journal articles from 25 years ago. So this starts in 1985. So that's how far you can trace this thread if you really want to trace the threads back deeply in time. Um, so the this charter school, though, is 28 years old now. This is uh, me hanging out in front of the building. Um, and so it is absolutely not new. Um, and I'm going to skip this video. Like, they talk a lot about their models. When I was in elementary video, school and middle school, um, and I loved check it out getting that perfect the report tablet, card. I loved getting all the A's. Uh, I was but like, they talk oh, gosh, about, I have to do everything what, what in my power for kids to, to transition the top of my to class. a whole new and assessment main model. Focus and I sought validation in that. When I got to Parker, everything changed. We didn't have grades anymore. It changes your perception about what the goal is. The goal is not to get an A or focus on that A. It's about, okay, let's focus on developing these skills. And then what- Okay, lovely. And we're all about developing the skills. Um, but I want to jump into some details. And then we'll talk about, with Carmen, scaling those details. Um, on the Padlet is a bunch of links to Francis Parker Charter Essential School. Their model of doing, um, for them, presentations of learning, um, it's, it's such a pure, simplistic, sustainable model that I just adore it. And so if you're like Sean, Sean, give a sense where are you at in that sort of implementation of your defenses kind of stage right now? Is Sean turned off video. Maybe he's oh, not hearing us. Might not be. But if you're in that stage of trying to get it up and running, this is the place to start for me. Like I wouldn't start anywhere else. It'd be insane. Um, so you can go learn all about their program. They're really good at sharing. They have their criteria for excellence document. And I'm going to let um, Colleen talk for just a second about their criteria uh, for excellence. The computer is being a little slow, so I apologize. Um, and um, so it's still current, even though those dates are, but so go down a, another one or two. Sure. Um, so yeah, if you look at this, we call it um, go back one, uh, LAMA, listening and media analysis. <laughs> um, you know, at the bottom, it says, you under process you generate questions about what you hear and what you see 
okay, that's true whether you're a seventh grader or a 12th grader. So we don't change the standard or incrementalize them. We don't, we don't support that model of like, you do this a little bit, you do this medium, you do it a lot. You know, we're not, we're not doing it like that. We're just saying, this is the standard. <laughs> this is meeting expectations as you see it here. So then, all right, I'm going to, I'm trying to move us along a little bit. She, we unpack these deeply in the entire video series. Um, but to keep it moving, uh, I want to explain the mountain. Um, everything, so, you know, different schools have different metaphors. And in a second, Carmen's going to talk a lot about backpack as a metaphor. Um, for them, uh, at Francis Parker Charter Essential School, uh, the metaphor is the mountain. Uh, the mountain is this thing. So uh, they talk about climbing the mountain. All kids need to get to the top of the mountain. We're going to help all kids get to the top of the mountain. All right, great. Lead lends itself to lots of great language. But what it actually means is this assessment model, beginning, approaching, and meeting. Those are their three critical criteria that they are assessing against. And they are assessing those three criteria for their 14 critical success skills in, inside of that document. All this is linked on the Padlet. Um, but look at the right-hand side. The beauty and simplicity of this is outstanding. So beginning, approaching, meeting, um, and it's not excelling or mastering. No, 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 none of that. Meeting. We're just gonna, we're, we're trying to meet the standard. That's what we're trying to do here. It's more simple than four point rubrics that have ex excelling and trying to distinguish it all. Um, and then uh, you can see how what this translates into, you can see up here um, at the top, how the mountain translates into this simple little dashed line, beginning, approaching, meeting. And then inside of approaches, where a teacher puts the X is telling a kid something. Like how close to approaching are you? How close to meeting are you? And all they have to do to tell the kid how close they are is put the X in a slightly different location. Um, that's a super simple way to share a whole lot of information without needing to build a massive rubric-based document with tons of uh, criteria in it and trying to explain how criteria one is different from criteria two is different from criteria. This is so much simpler. And because it's simpler, it's more sustainable. And sustainability is a really, really important part of this conversation because you're asking a school to do something that it is not used to doing. And giving a standardized test is a hell of a lot easier than doing a week-long performance assessment um, defenses kind of model. So in order to sustain this, we need to simplify it. And their approach to simplifying this entire thing, and they've been doing it for 28 years, right? So they are showing sustainability. So I love the a very simple model, but it has subtlety to it that I think... Um, yeah. And again, this is our scale. We, we use those expressions, beginning, approaching and meeting and that's that's really it there's very few times we put the word exceeds on a rubric um, we're just because again look walking do you need to exceed at walking <laughs> you know you're walking like yes you met the standard like a pretty good walker. Know? yeah <laughs> so we're not about exceeds, we're about meet the standard. If you, you know, certainly students sometimes have something very extraordinarily original or insightful or another way to do the problem that hadn't been approached that way before, absolutely. And we're going to acknowledge that and call it exceeds, but we are not placing exceeds on the rubric that students see. They know that it exists. <laughs> but it's not something we put out as um, an, an expectation that creates pressure. Okay, sorry, we're just continuing to move ourselves along. Oh, I love the... <clears throat> so now let me give you a little sense of how the school operates with, with this really foundational performance assessment system. And we're gonna be able to replace tests. 
They also start to do multidisciplinary work. They do multi-age work. You can start to free up some of your existing structures. Uh, so they have an integrated arts and humanities that, so these are the, the 14 skills. Remember I, I talked about they're gonna, there would be an art, there would be a portfolio artifact on each one of these. And you can see there is Llama, listening and media analysis. That's what they're calling Llama from that first video. There's 14 of these. And kids are building portfolio artifacts to all 14 of these. And generally, the first six are coming from their integrated arts and humanities class, which is all stuff that you're probably already doing in English class. Reading, writing, listening, and media analysis, oral presentation, some research skills. Artistic expression, sure, that's a little bit different and doesn't live in a lot of English classes right now, but I don't know why it doesn't. The kids should be doing poetry. Um, and so like those largely already exist in those spaces. And so they are just integrating social studies, what we would call social studies and what we would call English. They are integrating into arts and humanities and that job. And they're doing all of those jobs that we would consider to be critical jobs. And of course, they're talking about U.S. history along the way, right? They're not going to just ignore that a civil war happened um, in our history. Okay. Then mathematical problem solving, technical communication, scientific investigation, technology, everything lives in an integrated MST, math, science, tech, in a single domain there. But kids are building portfolio artifacts to each of these domains, okay? And in doing that, they are looking at specific topics in science, specific topics in social studies. Remember when I told you earlier in this thing that... Um, when I think I think we have been the, done this. Maybe if I, I'm repeating, some of you might have missed it. Um, science and math, um, no, math and English are languages. Science and social studies are all science. These two things are not the same. And so it's not surprising that a lot of the skills that you're seeing are skills that are more tightly related to languages um, and sort of the deployment where the topical domains are gonna be coming from science and social studies. That's what's gonna drive the thing that we're studying on a given day. Um, so it's not at all a surprise that they can do this in two major packages. One is a science English package and one is a math science tech kind of package. Like that just, it just, it makes sense in the organization of information in planet earth. Okay. Now there's a lot here. Let me not even ask you to read this. Uh, all I want to point out to you is that they do a great job of putting out, oh, I could just link to it from the Padlet, show you where it's at on the Padlet. Sorry, I should be doing it that way. Um, here on the Padlet is Francis Parker Charter Essential School. And you can go and you can see right below that is this entire video that we've been pulling snippets out of. They do a great job of showing their entire learning model over here under learn about our program. And then down here is assessments and more importantly, promotion by portfolio. And that promotion by portfolio, that's the thing that Sean is probably working on right now. And that all of you at some point in a deeper learning journey will begin to consider. And so this is a lot of narrative and it doesn't make for great like professional development to just sit and read a narrative, but they are explaining in detail how this process is working, how they are building their portfolios, how those portfolios are going to public exhibition, who is joining for that. So who's the audience made up of their advisor, teachers, parents, other students, members of the community, um, what happens, the students are answering questions about their work. Uh, so all of it is there and you can sort of spend some time uh, really diving deep into what I consider to be the best model that I've seen for doing this work. Uh, there's other great models. Envision schools in California, built with Stanford University, a huge fan of Envision, absolutely love the team at Envision. Um, they've got a good model as well, but this model at this charter school, which was developed by Ted Sizer in the first place, strikes me as this is still the best I've seen. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll stop there. There's more great stuff from Colleen in that um, 
little video series. I'll give one last one and then we'll turn our attention to scaling. Um, just let her have the last word. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, back to the bigger point of these gateways when students move from one division to the next and they do this performance exhibition, um, every project before that is preparing them to do that better. Just like I said, we scaffold skills. We also scaffold, you know, demonstration of mastery. They're doing it, doing it, doing it, you know, all year for two years. And then they have a public one, you know, that includes family and friends. Um, and then those, the division one and division two exhibitions prepare students for division three exhibition, which is senior project, which is highly independent. You know, so there's all these kind of plays within the plays that undergird and bolster the student to build these skills. All right, I'll stop share, bring it back to whole group. Um, Colleen is, works at their uh, Sizer Teacher Center and uh, is a great partner. If you all want someone to come and um, help on building this work, uh, they they work with other places to to try to help them get started on these journeys. But one of the things that I think is is so critical is to not run into this space of defenses or presentations of learning or gateways or pat passage presentations, backpack defense is what we're going to talk about next. To not run into that whole thing and make it really complicated. Like it will overwhelm your system. It's got to be easy to implement. It's got to be scaffolded. But if you get that package right, what you can do is essentially pull the traditional assessments out. So what you don't see at Francis Parker Charter Assessment School, Charter School, is a lot of the traditional assessments. They're not going to rely on standardized tests at all. They're not going to rely that much on like quizzes or other sort of single moment in time knowledge check of where you're at. They're asking kids to control their own journey and then check in with us on a regular basis. But ultimately, they then put the high stakes on it because it is a gateway presentation. You don't move to the next level without gateway. And so there's a lot of responsibility transfer here. Like remember the power dynamic shifting in performance assessment. <laughs> the power dynamic at this school is pretty fully shifted. It's the kid's responsibility to show their work. It's the kid's responsibility to be able to articulate what they've learned, to take ownership of the quality of their projects. And, and the, it's just been, it's been done to a level of near perfection and now sustained over almost 30 years. And so start there if you don't know where else to start. Thoughts, questions before we turn to like, so what happens if you have 100,000 kids? All right, you wanna jump into that, Justin? Okay, it sounds like they are also mentally wrestling with how do you deal with 100,000 kids? <laughs> so uh, I've got a couple of slides, Carmen, but why don't you just get started? And if it makes sense for me to add in a slide or a video, I will. But like, if you, if you yeah. just wanna start the story and then I can help support it. Sure, and I gave some slides to Ben to post mainly because of the resources in the slides. Um, so I can share some of those too, but um, so first of all, well, okay, we should introduce you real fast. You've been oh, sort of a longer sure. ride. Um, uh, Carmen Coleman, who is hanging out at a freaking awesome, I don't know, like you're winning the day, by the way, <laughs> being, being wherever you are, you're winning. Um, so Carmen has been a long time member of the journey of deeper learning in Kentucky. And in some ways, Carmen is a co-founder of the deeper learning movement in Kentucky. Um, going back 15-ish years or more, 
uh, as a superintendent in Danville, Kentucky, which is a little bit south of Lexington. She then joined our team at the Center for Next Generation Leadership um, and did this work, ran the academy, this thing that we've packaged in this new way, like Carmen ran this for a few years. Um, and then uh, signed on as the chief academic officer of Jefferson County Public Schools, which is Louisville, Kentucky. It's the whole county of Louisville. It is 100,000 kids in the school district. So it is a large urban school district. Um, and just recently left that to lead a regional deeper learning team now in the Ohio Valley region, which is Louisville and all of the districts around Louisville. Carmen is leading a small team that is trying to scale deeper learning across the entire region at this point. Um, so, I mean, and the legit as it comes in this work. And so uh, I know there's lots of other people in San Diego also super legit, but Carmen is on that list. So, um, okay, with all that background, Chief Academic Officer of Jefferson County Public Schools, how do you do deeper learning in a large American urban with 100,000 kids? Hmm. Yeah. Carmen, sorry, before you answer, not to cut you off, Carmen, let me know when you want me to throw your deck up and I can do that. Okay, or I can, sh oh, you probably have to share the screen. No, we can, no you, we can share it. We, we can add you if you want to do it, if you have it with uh, you. Yeah, whatever. Okay. It doesn't matter. Right. Um, so I've learned a lot in this journey and I always think about what, what made the difference for me. What, what, because I was a test score chaser. And, but I, but I, I, I love a goal and I think goals are so important for all of us. And, and to me, that number represented how our kids compared and how they would compete. And so that, you know, and that's all I knew, like that was the North star. That's the, that I started day one and, and that's what we had was, um, really tight assessment and accountability. And it was a, a really interesting time. So that's where I was. And, and, but for me, it started to change when I started to realize initially that we were really keeping kids from getting really good opportunities. Things like um, not having world language in elementary school because um, it's not tested and we don't really know how to make time for it. You know, hearing those kinds of things help me to start to think, well, this doesn't seem quite right. Um, but then what really changed me, and, and I share this because I'm always trying to think about how do I recreate what I experienced for others? Because once you experience that, you cannot go back. And, and for me, it was, it was coming to places like high tech high school out here in California, but, but even maybe more than that was seeing the same kind of thing in place where it wasn't beautiful, where there weren't palm trees. Um, where it, it, it seems so perfect out here that you think, well, I mean, of course it's perfect. Like the kids are doing yoga on the lawn. I mean, it's perfect, but it's not. I mean, you see when you're out here a little bit, the kids are kids like our kids. They, you know, they're no smarter. They're no, they're awesome kids. And, um, but, but for me seeing it in places like um, a school in New York City, that was located where the cab driver didn't want to let me out. I mean, he thought, I always say he thought the country mouse was gonna be eaten in the city. He could tell real quick. He was like, are you sure? Um, but the school was on the 10th floor of this awesome building and, and, or just an old building. What was awesome was when I got up to the, where the school started and the, it was like when Dorothy got to Oz, you know, it was like awesome, colorful and the vibrant and all the right things. Um, but the work that kids were doing was just like what I saw out here. And it was so far beyond what my kids were doing in my district at that time. And um, one student in particular, an African-American male, 
um, reminded me so much. And one of my colleagues from that district is on, Jennifer, she'll remember this student. There was a student um, in, in my district then, and his name was Max. And Max was a high school student, and he was like one of my favorites. You know, you're not supposed to have favorites, but Max was just awesome. And Max was so... Um, it was obvious he had been around adults. He was funny. He was, um, and I just thought he was brilliant. I really did. And um, he asked me when I first got to Danville if they had ever had a superintendent before. He was like, have we had somebody like you before now? He, you know, it was, he was just great. But anyway, I saw a young man at that school in New York City that that reminded me so much of Max, just in stature and in big smile. And but the work that kid was doing, that kid was writing a proposal for the Ground Zero Museum Board, trying to convince them about um, what kinds of artifacts should be in that museum. And, and the kids in Max's class had been Skyping with kids all over the country. When I walked in, they were Skyping with kids in Israel and they were asking them what they thought about America, what they knew, what they had heard about 9-11, what they, had, and I mean, it, you can imagine some of the things they said were really hard to hear. And, um, and the teacher said, I'm just trying to um, help my students have some perspective, right? So I'm trying to, it's pretty funny that I'm trying to like get where the sun is not blinding me. That's a new problem. Um, and, and I just, you know, I was in awe. I was just in awe. And then I had this sickening feeling that really changed me. And I thought the only reason that my kids aren't doing work like this, and especially Max, my, the best I could offer was AP classes. And even in those classes, the kids were doing note cards and maybe making a poster every once in a while. And I mean, it, they were preparing for a test and, and Max wasn't even getting that. And I thought here, Max could do this kind of work. He would love this. He's passionate, he's smart, he's talented. And I thought the difference is us, the difference is us. And so I share all that to say that I think it's really important when you, and this is what we did in JCPS, no matter how big or how small, I mean, when you're going into a system and you start talking about change, people get nervous, right? And and I think you always have to start with, make it personal, make it personal to them. And so for me, a big part of scaling an initiative, you have to start with the why. You have to start with the why and you have to make it super personal for people. So one of the things over time, and these are the questions we started with, um, in JCPS, it's, a, it's an iteration of the same question we started with in Danville, which was, which really is, what does our diploma mean? What, is, what does it mean? What value does a diploma from this school district carry? What are we promising to our community, to our students? to our families, to one another, how will kids be equipped for success? And, and what do we want? And I've found that the best way to do that, and even in Louisville where it was huge, I mean, 100,000 kids, like once you get over 5,000, like, what is that? I mean, you just, you know, make it a million for that matter. It's all of them. And I would start the very same way. And that is, you know, I have people take out a picture of a child that really matters to them and, and ask this series of questions. And in a place like Louisville, we couldn't get to every group you can imagine. We got to every group we could, we meaning the superintendent and I, got to every group we could and we went through these questions. But what we never did was to say, we're going to create a graduate profile. 
I mean, like, that's what we were doing, but that does, that is not personal. I don't think to people like this. And I've learned that this year, that's been a real, you know, it can't feel like here's another thing that we're doing. Here's the latest buzzword. It's grad profile. And we're gonna, we're gonna jump in as a district to the latest thing. And I, I think there is no, maybe nothing more important than that starting point. Um, we ask a series of three questions and for groups, for school staffs, for community groups, anybody we couldn't get to, we ask them to go through these questions and send us their responses to the first one. So what skills do you want? How do you want us to equip this important child um, how, how do you want us to equip them for success? And then the next question is always, so, okay, those are the, that's what's most important you've said. And I always say academics are a given. This is not about academics or. Academics, we are a school district. We are a school system. Academics, all right, we're there. We, we're all gonna agree on that. Let's just take that off the table. But what else? And then um, what kinds of experiences lead to those outcomes? And, and I think this is important because what you show very quickly is that we all know what this looks like. Like I like to give those groups just a minute or two to come up with um, what, it, what experiences will lead to those. And even people who are not teachers, especially people who are not teachers sometimes, are very quick to say, oh my gosh, well, it's things like solving a problem or, um, you know, trying to figure something out that really matters to the kids and, and you know, or solving a community issue. We all know, even things like the breakout games, right? That we all know what leads to those kind of outcomes. Outcomes, every group gives the same list outcomes like communication, collaboration, um, you know, a globally and culturally competent citizen. Um, the lists are always the same, always the same. Um, and then you, you really get, um, you know, it really gets to be a tough conversation when you start to wrestle with number three. And you don't have to say a lot. Um, what you find out, no matter the group, is these kinds of experiences that we say are essential to, to equip my important child for success are happening around the edges of school. And, and so I find that that awareness and that establishing that why, I don't care wh what the size or what the, you've got to give everybody, um, you've got a level set like that. And, and, and my experience has been, even in JCPS where there's a really strong teachers union and even they, there, the union was very committed to, to deeper learning, but, there, there's, they, you know, unions can be contrary sometimes. And this was, this meant change, but nobody pushes back on this. Nobody pushes back on that. I don't, Justin, do you want to add anything there? Is there anything you were thinking? And I'll go on if not. No, yeah, let's, let's jump to the kind of, like when you get to Jefferson, you start to ask these questions. Yeah. There is a choice though. There's a leadership choice that happens around beginning to create and set the conditions of why, but simultaneously making a big choice around we're going to pursue something different and it's not going to be voluntary. <laughs> so that's right. That, that's a big choice. <clears throat> that's right. So we asked those questions and then we came up with through a process um, that was messy. And, and I should add, first of all, we did not know exactly how we were going to get where we wanted to be. So that's important too. 
Like I see schools and districts that want to have everything figured out before they take a step, every detail. Well, what you do there is really procrastinate until the kids are all in the home somewhere. I mean, like the kids are here today. The kids are here today and we're not doing them any justice today. So we have to figure out what it is that we're gonna do to make a difference today, today. So we jumped in and, and this essentially was our theory of action, but I can even make it simpler than this. And this came from hearing Bob Lenz out here say, um, if we want kids to have awesome learning, worth getting excited about, if we want them to be excited about what they're learning, and if we want kids to be motivated, then we have to give them learning worth being excited about. And what we added to this was, we're not gonna, we're not just gonna put this, here's what we want out there if, and, and leave it alone. If we do that, all we've done is create a vision statement or another mission kind of statement. And I know those are important. The theory behind them is important, but just on their own, no mission or vision statement has ever changed the student experience, I don't believe. They can hang on the wall, but nothing magical happens there. And I personally cannot stand compliance for compliance sake. And so I, you know, if, if we're gonna spend the time to do something, I wanna know that this is gonna be living in our district every day. And so what we decided was, all right, here's, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna decide as a community what we want, and then we're gonna figure out what kind of evidence will help us to know that, that's going to that those things are happening every day. Because really at its core, this is about equity. This is about changing the student experience and making sure that every student has awesome learning experiences and, and is really gaining um, all the things you said you wanted. And I say that all the time to people. Now, wait a minute, this is what you said you wanted. How is this leading to this? And I keep that coming back to that all the time um, to the point that people get real tired of it. But we decided, all right, here's what we're gonna do. Now, mind you, we did not know this is what this is where we were. We're gonna say we want to see work from every student that that represents the application of academic content and what we called success skills. That was our that was our graduate profile skills. There they were. They're right there. They are on the screen. And, and we had defined those with um, real clear, like five bullets under each one. But listen, when we launched, we didn't have those five bullets under each one. <laughs> I mean, you talk about simple. We, I mean, we, we took off and we just said, all right, here, we, every student is going to have on the first day of school in 2018, they're going to have a digital backpack. And every year, every student is going to add artifacts that represent both academic content and success skills. That's the kind of work we're talking about. And, and one of the things that we, we had to do, I mean, you, what you, where you have to start it, that's funny, I'll come back to that. But you start at, you, we got to make it safe to try right and teachers we couldn't we had to make sure that teachers didn't feel like well wait a minute i haven't had project based learning training i can't do this this is bigger than project based learning project based learning is an awesome vehicle and if you can do it right and do it well absolutely it will get at exactly what we're after but that's not the only way this is about day-to-day -day 
how are you having kids show what they've learned, right? And I, it was so funny. So this, this, um, I was going, I was talking about the backpack and what kinds of artifacts, you know, what we were looking for, just in the language that I'm talking about with you. And there was a, a parent who was also a staff member whose student, whose um, third grader was there in the room. Um, like, you know, sitting in the back, you know, while the grownups have a meeting, you know how that goes. And that kid, um, after the meeting, says to um, her mom, so things like worksheets, that's not what's going to be good in the backpack, is it? And her mom was like, okay, the third grader got it. Um, and, and then... We just start, so that year, I share again, we had no clue what that was going to look like, but we said, all right, we, we had a team that, and, and I, I should say too, to, to scale and spread, everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody has to speak the same language and everybody has to understand the goal. So there was a lot of educating that went on with our colleagues, right? Here's what we're after. Here's why. Going through that same, those same three questions with everybody. And, and then, so the school year starts, we had a, um, a digital innovation team, a small but mighty team of five people to start. And they made a plan for how are we going to how are we going to equip teachers? I mean, this district at that time was really kind of a technology desert, like a digital desert, I would call it. How are we going to equip schools and teachers and students? Students were easy, but to know how, how, how this digital backpack works. Um, and they came up with how that would look and how the how what what kind of uh, mechanism actually served as the digital backpack um and then equipped folks to make it happen and went out i mean we all all of us were side by side with teachers and schools and putting a really bright spotlight as we saw the things start to happen. And, and one of the things our district communications team did, they would be, they were so with us on the journey. And so I would say, listen, I've got something here we need to highlight. They would, you'll see here, this is the YouTube channel that we created. And, and they put we put teacher after teacher and student after student in the spotlight to say this, here's a great example of something that you should put in your backpack. And if you were going to do that, which of these skills would you say that you grew in the most during this without any descriptors, without any kids could say, oh, yeah, I had to really talk to my friends and we had to work together on this and I mean so we started really rough but um, right off the bat it was really important to us to put put teachers and kids in the spotlight and make a lot of noise about what we were seeing and and what they knew and what I knew from previous experience was that if we could just get to, because we said, here's what else is going to happen. In fifth, eighth, and 12th grade, every student is going to have to do, and it was actually my superintendent who called them defenses. We called them gateways in my former district. I feel the same way about the term defense. I don't love that for that reason um, that, that she explained earlier, but, you know, that's what that's what they became and that's what they still are so every student is going to have to do a defense in fifth eighth and twelfth grade to show their work to show how they've grown and to just talk about themselves and and where they are as learners and um and so can i jump in yeah 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 we only have a couple of minutes left. I know it's crazy to share, but these are crazy sprints. And so 
Um, I want to let a couple questions from the audience pop in, if that's possible. Oh, absolutely. Um, Carmen is willing, probably willing to share the deck. I've put a lot of resources yeah, into the it. Padlet. Um, so you can sort of see how this got built out. You can see examples. As Carmen said, they did an amazing job. In fact, I even put the hashtag was rolling yesterday. So it's it's backpack season um, yeah, in mobile. And so the Twitter posts are, are out there. Um, Stuart um, uh, has a great, they put together some kind of great little stream of all kinds of defenses. That oh, are good. Okay. Yeah. So Anyway, um, you there's plenty of stuff to look at in, in this space, but let me just open it to a couple of questions because while you didn't scale to 100,000 kids in a given year, you're doing it in fifth, eighth, and 12th in every single year. And for real in Louisville, that is at least 10,000, 15,000 kids per year that are defending their learning. Yeah, and, and every kid, even though every kid didn't defend every year, every kid had to add artifacts every year. Kindergartners, everybody, everybody. Yeah, so questions. Got lots, of video, lots of resources here you can use. Yeah, questions, thoughts. I mean, to the question of can you scale this? Like, can you, well, look. I mean, that was a big scaling job. And while it's not perfect in Louisville by any stretch of the imagination, um, and it's not the pure thing that Sizer or uh, the Francis Parker Charter School has, which is a 30 year old, super honed in pure model, like this thing is working. And it's working to the point of kids understand more about their own journey. The agency thing is happening for real, the metacognitive thing is happening for real. The teachers reflecting on the quality of their work thing is happening for real. Like all of those component parts are beginning to happen. In fact, they've been happening now for like four or five years. And so at this point, they're embedding, deepening. The roots are growing. Yeah, Mark or whoever wants to jump in. Just had to find the unmute. Um, by the way, I, I, I was just blown away by your presentation. It's just amazing to, to tell that story, especially with, with a specific student in mind and to make it personal um, and just your starting place without using scary language. It's just, it's very, it's, thank you. That was very powerful. Um, and, and also the use of a backpack. And, and also, I think when you were talking about project-based learning not being a necessity, yeah. I think that's also, it takes the intimidation factor away, I think, for some people. And I wrote down, I think the guiding question is, what are we doing that's worthy of a backpack is sort of what people had to ask themselves, yeah. um, which is a, a really, I think, helpful and simple yet powerful question. So I was blown away by that too. So thank you. I have a, a sort of like how you use the tool question, because I'm guessing that, that it's really important that that backpack then travels with the student while they're in the school system. So you must have had sort of on the technology front a way for that backpack to travel with them and for teachers to have access to that from year to year. But that's what I'm thinking about now because I like right. you sold me. It's it's really amazing. <laughs> I want to know how yeah. it works. Yeah, in fact, the kids, so the kids have access. Um, it's really a set of Google folders, honestly, but it's more complicated than that. I mean, it's it's more, there's more to it a little bit than that, but not not a lot. I mean. And so every year kids can look at what they've done in the past years and what what happens now. In fact, I was in a defense there last week. A fifth grader used an artifact from fourth grade and an artifact from third grade to talk about his growth um, as a learner. And that's what I tell people to just get to defenses. If people are mad and kicking and screaming about it, just buckle down you can make it get to defenses and that's all it takes. People cannot believe what the kids can do. So I think, uh, yes, some of the things that stood out for me, Carmen, is the power of questions because when you ask these really, really good questions, you're actually, you start to challenge those assumptions and you start to actually uncover what people take as like, oh, that's just the way we do things. As like, well, actually it's not really the best way or and we're actually what we're doing isn't giving us what we want so questions are a great way to start and i think that leads into like the power of process because i think a lot of what you talked about is is involving people and different people at different times 
And so people feel like they have sort of ownership over it. But I think process is really important because you can't come in and say, you know, we're just doing this overnight, right? You're just going to like start tomorrow. But that said, I think another thing you sort of touched on is you really, there has to be someone who's willing to be really brave. And that's one of the things that I've seen everywhere we go. You know, it's, it's that being brave and saying, you know, what we're doing is not sufficient. What we're doing is not getting, is not providing our students the experience that we believe they are, uh, you know, that we're promising them really, right? So I think that that's another thing. Uh, and then the last thing I think that you, you touched on that I think is super important as well is telling your story because you need that evidence, right? You need the evidence of that what you are actually doing is working, right? So at the beginning, you're saying, we don't believe that we're, we're providing our students with the experiences and the, and the skills that they need to be successful because you, know, you define that at the beginning. And then it's important that you actually provide that evidence that you're actually doing what you say you're doing, right? And highlighting those behaviors that you are engaging in to produce those outcomes, right? And like, you, you know, you talk about that evidence, right? So I think those are some of the things that, that stood out for me. So amazing. Well, okay, team, we are a few minutes past and I want to be respectful of everyone's time and Carmen and Ben still have big days ahead. They probably need to go grab some breakfast out there on the West Coast. Um, we'll circle back around on Thursday. On Thursday now, uh, we'll take these performance assessment pieces and begin to build them together. So how do you begin to layer performance assessments to essentially make this how we do school? Um, and that is uh, the part that becomes really powerful because that's where you're going to sort of redefine the nature of your school away from a traditional model towards something that's new. Um, okay. We'll also spend some time unpacking. I'm curious the thoughts and questions you have coming out of today. De this whole world of, of defenses or gateways or whatever you want to call it is hard and complex, and I don't want to minimize the complexity around it. Um, there's a lot here, and this is one from a leadership standpoint, you don't just launch off into this without having a sense of what you're doing. And so um, I, I want to be circle back around and answer some questions again on Thursday, and then we'll start to put all these performance assessment pieces together. And then on Thursday, we close sprint number two. Um, so like, yeah, this thing is just rolling fast, team. Uh, and we're just trying to get you lots of tools and stuff. And Carmen is, um, we need to get a Twitter link in there uh, so that they can connect with you on Twitter, um, Carmen, and um, ask follow-up questions, that unpack that whole Jefferson story. I, When Jefferson did all this, like I just assumed every progressive education thing in America was going to come set up shop in Louisville and try to understand it. And a few did. There's been some good stories. Tom Vander Ark has done some stories, uh, but there's not nearly enough national attention. Everyone still wants to go to the $1,000 High Tech High Conference and not come to the relatively affordable Jefferson Deeper Learning Conference, uh, which has been running for the last few years. So it's definitely a story that deserves more love. Okay, thank you all. We'll see you same time, right. nine o'clock Thursday um, to get our folks in. Ben, jump in. Yeah, sorry, I just dropped uh, Carmen's uh, Twitter handle in the chat, but I'll put it on the Padlet. So people, once we close the chat, uh... People will find it on the Padlet. <laughs>